Hello everyone. Welcome to uh, Hermeneutics, the Rules of Bible Interpretation, lecture number six. I'm pretty sure it could be lecture seven. Forgive me if I'm making a mistake, but I'm pretty sure it's lecture six. I will confirm that. Um, but at any rate, there's a lot to get done here. Um, what we were doing last time on the last lecture is just helping you see how we're going to take Acts chapter 8 verses 15 through 17 and we're going to begin to make it manageable okay um, to more thoroughly understand it and uh, I laid out for you the words of interest that we're going to you know begin to focus on to start with and the first one of course being the Holy Ghost and so we started categorizing the different dimensions of the work of the Holy Ghost so we can understand a little bit more about the context here with respect to receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit at the new birth and, and also then a work of, uh, of power and authority that is then displayed in this notion that is presented here in Acts chapter 8 of those at Samaria having received the gift of salvation. We know that if anybody calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus, they will be saved. We know that the power of the Holy Ghost was present to do signs and wonders and miracles through the ministry of Philip. And so we can also be certain that, you know, they were saved. They called upon the name of the Lord Jesus. The power of the Holy Ghost was there to bring to pass the miracle of the new birth. Um, however, the gift of the Holy Ghost had not fallen on any of them. So, you know, the next word that I want to just look at for just a minute here is the word fallen, uh, where the Holy Ghost fell upon them. But just before I do that, let's just uh, look at some of the categories, some of the results that you got from searching um, just Holy Ghost in the New Testament. And then, of course, let me just also add this, uh, that when you begin to look at synonyms or you begin to look at other alternatives of, of the way that a particular um, thought, thing, person is addressed, then it begins to expand this, uh, you know, um, information base even more. So with the Holy Ghost, we know that an alternative uh, name is um, spirit and um, that is used over and over again concerning the Holy Ghost or spirit of God. And so then that then broadens that much more of the information that we can get concerning the Holy Ghost. And so as you've been categorizing this ministry, uh, you know, the act, the actions of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Ghost, all the various different categories that you developed in your research, then you've seen the work of the Holy Ghost um, in terms of the one that is actually uh, the source behind the miracles and the signs and the wonders, um, as well as the one who is um, the agent, if you would, <laughs> In salvation, being born of the Spirit, for example. And I wish I had the time to go through each one of these and categorize them for you. And just to help you get really good at that. And maybe some of the more obscure ones or more uh, um, a little more difficult to understand um, words that we will search out. Maybe I could actually, in these lectures, spend a little bit more time helping you, you know, categorize all the various different information that we receive from the Bible um, on that specific word or topic. So, um, you know, one of the things I hope that you noticed is the great pattern that is set for us in the person of, uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Number one, we learned right off the bat that the Holy Ghost was the agent involved in the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the person involved in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, those first few verses of Scripture that we referenced last time um, there in Matthew chapter 1, um, verse 18, um, you know, and also I believe, what was it? Uh, let me look real quickly in my own notes. I'll just type in real quick, I, my, Matthew 1, 18. And now the birth of Jesus Christ happened like this. When Mary was the spouse of Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And then again in verse 20, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, the son of David, 
fear not take to take unto you uh, Mary to be your wife, for that which um, is conceived in her is by the Holy Ghost. So we can see that Jesus was born by the Holy Spirit, you know, and uh, we're born by the Holy Spirit. Uh, John chapter 3, and, you know, this isn't taking the, the type too far here because we certainly are uh, born of the Spirit. That's the new birth. That's really what Paul is saying. Also, all the way to Titus 3, um, what is it, verse 5, that we've been washed with the water of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost. A great definition of salvation. And, um, you know, sometimes we just like to say it like this, because as you begin to search this out, you know, you just you, you see this, that um, at, at the new birth, we receive the life of God by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into our life, empowering us to live the life of Christ. And then when we're baptized in the Holy Ghost, we're empowered by God to do the ministry and the works of Jesus Christ. And, you know, in none of the examples that we're going to compare here on salvation, are we going to see anyone that is exempt from being, you know, endued with power from on high or receiving this ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ that was highlighted from the very beginning um, by John the Baptist said, who said, I baptize you with water, but the one who's coming after me, referring to the Lord Jesus, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And so the Holy Ghost ministry really begins to be highlighted here. And you'll also notice that, you know, as you begin, and we'll see this more as we, as we begin to draw out what's being said here and these very important doctrines that are being presented, that this, this ministry of being endued with power to do to walk in the ministry of Jesus, to walk in the power and the authority of Jesus' ministry, to be the representative of heaven that God has empowered us to be, is also referred to as the gift of God or the gift of the Holy Ghost. So we have everything from the gift of God as it's presented. And we'll, once again, we're going to talk more about this and break it out more, but we'll have the gift of God that is presented to the woman at the well um, in John chapter 4. And the gift of God that is also then presented in the context of uh, salvation that took place at Cornelius' house as it's associated with the gift of the Holy Ghost. So I'm not trying to, I don't want to be indoctrinating people. Um, I want to be actually walking through each time with you and letting you look at the whole of the information. Uh, but at the same time, uh, because of the brevity uh, that we are confined to in only doing these lectures um, for pretty much 55 minutes, you know, we've got to try to give you the ability to understand where we've been and, and where we're going. Um, one of the important words too, that I want to look at real quick, and then maybe we can come back and, and maybe look a little bit more at, um, this, you know, what it, what it truly means, um, to be born again in, in terms of, of, being born of the Spirit and receiving the Holy Spirit at the new birth and what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, which is not a second work of grace as is put forth by uh, John Wesley and others because it's all encompassed into one gift of God. And that's what makes it a little bit confusing as you begin to sort out the data where you see, as it were, both are included and there is as though they are both events that take place simultaneously and at the same time there is a distinction in these these events and we're going to see that you can't lock a salvific expression into one formula um, in the sense or or baptism in one formula because you're going to see that some people are Cornelius's house they were baptized in the Holy Ghost before they were ever baptized in water Okay, um, you can see in Samaria here that here they are, you know, they call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, and of course they're saved, and that they receive the uh, the new birth experience. They're made a new creation. They're made a new creature, which are all once again when you go back and we begin to study. Well, what is salvation? Which is the next word that we're going to be picking up here after uh, here. Well, in the, in the very uh, short time we're going to be picking up this w word. On salvation um, but at any rate you're going to see with salvation there are synonyms like born again new birth uh, uh, new creation new creature um, you know those types of, of terminologies that are used even even as Paul describes it 
the washing of water regeneration or the regeneration, okay? Um, it's all a part of the new birth. The Holy Ghost is involved in that. We're born of the Spirit, you know, and then also born of the water, which then, you know, once again, it, it, if, we, if we're not careful, we're going to begin to go off on a tangent there because, as I said, when you start doing these studies, it, all of a sudden, more words are going to be popping out to you, more ideas, more thoughts, more revelation, and you've got to have a notebook wherein you just jot down, oh, you know, I need to run down. What does it mean to be, for example, born of the water? And I need to do more of a study on that and, you know, sort out um, and search out that typology or that allegory um, that is used there. Uh, because sometimes I think that people are more receptive of just understanding what does it mean, you know, the idea of being born of the spirit, whereas, you know, the, being born of the water seems to be more allegorical. And so we'll, we'll talk, we could talk about that maybe later, but right now, just trying to keep a pace here, uh, a pace with, with what we're doing. Uh, let me just kind of first and foremost, I just kind of itemize some of the, re the results, some of the more obvious things here of the Holy Spirit, which, which quickly comes to the surface, is the Holy Spirit is not only involved in salvation, uh, but is received it at salvation at the time of being born again. And the Holy Spirit is also the one who is responsible for the acts of power, not only witness in the life of Jesus, but also those that receive the same divine ability uh, to function in the ministry of Jesus. So we see Jesus born of the Spirit, and then we see Jesus 30 years later baptized in the Holy Ghost. And the Spirit of the Lord came down upon him, and, and that was one of the ways the Spirit of the Lord fell upon him or came upon him and, uh, and remained. And that was one of the ways that we were able, that John was able to witness that he was indeed the Christ, the Messiah. And so it's similarly, we're going to be able to see then here at Samaria that they were born of the Spirit, and then you see subsequently that when Peter and John comes down from Jerusalem, they receive now another dimension of the Holy Ghost. And that is that they, were, they received this gift of God, the gift of the Holy Ghost, in which the Holy Ghost fell upon them. Okay, and so we want to pick up that word here in just a moment to help us really understand this a little bit more. And of course, when we're looking here in um, Acts chapter 8, verses 12, as I pointed out last time, verses 15 through 17, you know, obviously we can assume that they're born again. And if they weren't born again, then who is born again? And what must you do more than the Samaritans did to be born again? That is a very important point to make. And so we're really dealing with a contrast between calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and being baptized in water and, and ultimately understanding the expression of the new birth that is already there in the Samaritans. And then recognizing, you know, that if you continued on in, in the book of Acts, that that was the same thing that uh, Philip walked the, uh, the eunuch through as he was expressing to him this wonderful gift of salvation um, as, you know, the eunuch was reading Isaiah and, you know, Philip joined himself under the eunuch. The eunuch, one of the first questions that the eunuch is asking Philip is what must, you know, what hinders me from being baptized? So we know that that was a big part of the message that Philip preached. And at the same time, though, you can't lock that into a formula as we're going to see. Uh, you, you can't say, well, you got to be saved, baptized in water, then you're a candidate to receive the, this gift of the Holy Ghost. Because when we begin to compare salvation events, that isn't going to hold up. And so you're not going to, we're not going to be able to lock the Lord into a certain baptism formula, salvation formula, as it were, because once again, it, it, Cornelius, Cornelius's house in Acts chapter 10, you know, as Paul pre, uh, forgive me, as Peter was just preaching, Peter's just preaching. <laughs> he hasn't made an altar call yet, okay? And the Holy Ghost fell upon them, and they all began to speak in, in, in other tongues, just like it happened on the day of Pentecost. And of course, ultimately, as you begin to look and evaluate that pericope there beginning, you know, um, 
I think it's probably um, Acts 10, verse 43, right around in there. You see that ultimately by the time you get to Acts 11, Peter is making the argument that they had received the gift of the Holy Ghost, um, just like the 120, just like all of the apostles, all of them had already received. And so he says, "What? why could I prevent them from also being, you know, baptized in water? And so, you know, <laughs> here they're receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost, then they're getting baptized in water later. So you can't lock God into a formula. It's just you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you're going to be saved. Now, we're going to deal with that a little bit more in salvation and as we, you know, search out these words on salvation. And let me just say this. It's a great time to make this point, okay? And that is that one of the things you're going to have to be willing to do is always search out all of the synonyms, okay? I know I told you also anonyms are very good at the same time because sometimes when you look at the opposite of the word, it helps you understand maybe a little bit more about the word that you're actually uh, exploring the definition of. Um, but the bottom line of it is with salvation, we're going to do salvation, saved. There'll be a whole host of words that we want to list out because we want to run down all of those words so that we can get a full scope of exactly what salvation means. What does it mean to be saved? Okay, so let me let me just kind of help connect a an important dot for us. And then I, I think I might go back and look at a little bit more of the Holy Ghost and the categories associated with that. But this particular point here in verse 16 that is so important for us to grasp, and that is that for as for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, grasping the reality that um, we know how easy it is to be born again and that you're born by the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, when you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and that there was a commission given uh, in the New Testament by the Lord Jesus Christ that there should be water baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost which also then we see expressed in Acts chapter 2, being baptized in the name of Jesus. And we'll see that expressed again and again, which doesn't do away with baptism in, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. It is just inclusive and just that much more specific about this authority and this name uh, that has been given to the Lord Jesus. So we're going to run down baptism. That's an important word for us to be able to get the whole picture here. And so, you know, I'm careful, I'm trying to be careful about not jumping ahead and then stepping on your doctrinal toes and then losing you in the process because you believe one thing or the other. You know, it's probably going to be a lot broader. I'm certain it is. But the truth is going to be a, a lot broader than what you understand it right now. It's going to be a lot deeper. It's going to be a lot higher. Okay, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have a whole lot more impact and a whole lot more uh, effect if we'll just be willing to mature and grow in what God says and receive the whole counsel of God. So one of the things that you want to look at here is what does it mean for the Holy Ghost to, to fall upon someone? Okay, because that's part and parcel to us really getting at this breaking out of an event. And... You know, I would say that probably, you know, this this gift of the Holy Ghost here, uh, in terms of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is more specifically and uniquely and distinctively broken out here in Acts chapter eight than maybe any place else in the New Testament other than the uh, the initial event of Pentecost that we read about in Acts chapter two. Um, in Acts chapter two, um, it's it's safe to assume that the 120 were saved, that they were born again. Um, you know, <laughs> what does it take to be born again? What does it take to be saved? What, you know, what does it take to be born of the Spirit? And I know that people are going to argue that point. So that's why I'm not really making that as a contrast of, sal of salvific events or salvation events 
and the way they transpired uh, as described in the New Testament, but just staying more specifically in the comparing of the salvation events. Uh, for example, as I said, which we're going to do here uh, in the next few lectures of Acts 2.38, Acts 8.37, Acts 10.44, and Acts 19.6. Um, you know, and there's other salvation events that we could look at that are reflective in Paul's writings or in John's writings or in Peter's writings. Um, and we may have time to do some of that, but um, those, co those comparative events in the book of Acts should bring a lot of insight to us. And if we're just willing to let the word of God, you know, interpret the word of God and explain for itself what it means, rather than getting lost up in doctrinal ideas or semantics, you know, the beautiful thing of it is, is the miracle of the Word of God is free to work in our lives, the divine expression and confirmation that the miraculous Word of God alone can work if we're willing to receive it. If we're going to shut it down and not receive what God is saying uh, because we just want to believe it one certain way, then certainly that has got to have an, uh, you know, a limiting impact upon our life in terms of how we move as God. So let's just, you know, this is a great time to utilize your, um, your Bible software uh, in terms of uh, doing uh, comparisons um, of, of words and uh, of a Greek word. And, you know, we really have to do this with a Greek word. And I know that some people get a little scared there and up until recent, yeah, it, it was a reason to uh, be a little bit intimidated because it was difficult to, if you weren't versed in Greek or Hebrew, to really get at where this particular type of Greek word, uh, for this example, is used elsewhere in the Bible. Um, but the, the word is epipetu, and don't be frightened by it. Just look in your software and, and most software, you can just basically point and click. And this Greek word, epipetu, is going to, uh, to pop up. And lo and behold, we're going to find out that this particular word primarily is an expression uh, to uh, 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 not only fallen, that the Holy Spirit has fallen, but that the Holy Spirit fell. Okay, and then that's going to begin to open up a whole bunch of other opportunities for us to begin to then add to our list of words that we want to to actually compare and contrast with this same topic. Okay, so for example, as you're turning to Acts ten forty four, which in your search engine, that is going to be one of the places that you're going to see that this word occurs. And it occurs in the same exact context because, once again, we're talking about that salvific experience, that work in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, you know, uh, we, we could, let, let me just say this. There, there are just so many points to be made um, that I try to edit myself as I go. Um, but uh, I can't overemphasize that the baptism in the Holy Ghost is the heavenly ministry of Jesus. I can't overemphasize that. While he was on the earth, there are no examples of anyone being baptized in the Holy Ghost. Until he died, was crucified, buried, rose again, and then on after the he was ascended up on high on the day of Pentecost, 50 days later after his death, then this gift of the Holy Ghost was poured out. So ultimately, that's when his baptismal ministry started. Um, so real quickly, let's go over and just let's go to Acts because I was about to take us off on another tangent because there's really so many things to say here, okay, uh, when we begin to talk about the gift of the Holy Ghost but let's go, and, and the working of the Holy Spirit and the re reality of the Holy Ghost falling on someone because now we can tr contrast and compare to being filled with the Spirit. As Paul said, don't be drunk with wine wherein it's excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And we know that that would be an ongoing, continual filling of this, being filled with the Spirit 
because he equates that to speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and he makes it. So I don't have to go into the the nature of the of how the grammar of that particular word is used, and then you know flesh out that that is a continuous, ongoing thing um, from the you know reaching into stretching the grammar. I can know that it's a continuous ongoing thing because that's what should be continuously and ongoing in our continuous and ongoing in our life. To speak to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, giving thanks unto the Lord, as is mentioned there in Acts chapter, or forgive me, Ephesians chapter five and verse eighteen. So it begins to expand for us as we go, and I hope you can appreciate that. Here we're running down, you know, what the work of the Holy Ghost, the ministry of the Holy Ghost, the activities of the Holy Ghost, the actions of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Ghost. We begin to categorize these things. Then we begin to go into what is it in this one particular action or activity of the Holy Ghost where the Holy Ghost actually comes and falls upon a person, okay? Then we can look back, for example, in Acts chapter 2, and we can see that Jesus said that, you will be baptized by the Holy Ghost. Acts, well, not many days from now. Acts chapter one, verse five. He equates it to the ministry of Jesus. Uh, uh, equates it to the to, to those things which was expressed in the ministry of John about Jesus in Acts one five. It says, remember what John said. Now Peter's going to uh, forgive me. Paul's going to take that same notion up again. Now remember what John said. He's going to say that again in in, in Acts chapter nineteen. He's going to bring it back to that testimony. Of the of what John gave concerning Jesus, he would baptize you in the Holy Ghost, and also it could be said Holy Ghost and fire. Okay, so you know, see how the the definition and the topic is being expanded because now what happens is we recognize that by the time you get to Acts chapter two, it doesn't use they were baptized in the Holy Ghost. It says they were filled with the Holy Ghost. So now all of a sudden, Acts chapter two verse four. Uh, you know, looking at that entire pericope, if you would, one through five, they are filled with the Holy Ghost. And so now we equate being filled with the Holy Ghost to baptized in the Holy Ghost. And so now I've just expanded, as it were, a synonym that you are never going to get as a synonym from a thesaurus. You're never going to get from a, as a synonym from the, uh, a thesaurus, baptized and filled. This is a a synonym that is related to us by context in the Word of God. I hope that makes sense to you, and, and I, I know I could have probably uh, taken a little bit more time to express that, and, and maybe I should. Maybe I just stop before before I continue on and take you over to Acts 10.44. Let's just back up, seeing as I, I talk about this, because it really comes back to something that is, that is fundamentally highlighted about the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and the ministry of, of redemption and that which Christ Jesus won for us, which is absolutely something uh, that should captivate us. It's the promise of the Father, where, that's where Luke chapter 24 begins to expand this wonderful activity of the Holy Ghost even further. Okay, it's not only, it's the promise of the Holy Spirit uh, that is, is, is laid out for us in Luke chapter 24, as I said, promise of the Father, you know, um, those things that we could begin to talk even more um, broadly about in terms of how it was referred to, this wonderful event was referred to Joel, referred to by Joel, by Isaiah, by other prophets. But just trying to stick with just one thing real quickly here in, in terms of connecting um, the baptismal ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ with this event of being baptized in the Holy Ghost in a context of it being something that happens after people are saved, as it did in Samaria. Not limited to that. It doesn't have to take place that way because when we begin to contrast and compare salvific events, then what we understand is that there is absolutely no way to, to make a formula here. So then what we look at here in, in, in Acts 1.5, we say, for John truly baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now. So once again, he takes it back. He compares that now 
and, 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 and by category to exactly what John was saying concerning who Jesus was and the identification of Jesus. And so then, of course, it said again in verse 8, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and then shall you then you shall be my witnesses. So once again, those two, those words are used, baptism is used again and again. Maybe we could, and we'll hit on this again here because there's not just one type of baptism. There's baptism in the Holy Ghost. There's baptism in water. There's baptism into the body of Christ. All of those things are very important to begin to understand the uniqueness of them. But what I want to get for you real quickly is understanding in Acts 2 and verse 2 said, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house and they were uh, where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them clothing tongues like as a fire, and set upon each of them, and they were all baptized with the Holy Ghost. Well, it doesn't say baptized with the Holy Ghost. We know that that is the expectation. We know that that is exactly what is taking place, but it uses another word. It uses filled with the Holy Ghost, which then expands for us, as I said, the ability to go out there and begin to understand more fully this wonderful act of divine grace that has been given to us. Well, you know, I certainly don't want to overwhelm you with these things. I just, I want to help you to hopefully appreciate the enormity of it. I mean, and how that the word of God truly does interpret itself. If you'll just allow, it's like a thread that as you begin to explore um, one dimension of salvation that threads through every verse of scripture you begin to see how the parts and the pieces, you know, begin to come together and are almost like saying the same thing over and over again, but just in different words that, as it were, it's not redundant. It breaks out the details. It begins to slice the layers of it out, you know, sagittally. You know, we used to do this with looking in, in you know, uh, at tissue. You begin to cut different areas of the tissue. You could see different, you know, dimensions of the way that that the cells, the types of cells, and and the structure of the tissue is is formed and put together, and identify various different functions within the framework of the cells and the tissue. As you did these, you know, very fine slices. It's the same thing with the Word of God. Every time you slice through this. It's opening up a greater descript definition and 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 of the details or describing the details with more specification, rather than just looking at the whole picture of the body or one muscle or one organ. Now it's saying, okay, well here is the organ or you know here is the body, here is a specific organ. Okay, you're not going to change anything about that. It's it's kidney, it's heart, it's liver, it's lung tissue, whatever. But what we're going to do is we're going to take this feature, which looks like one thing, like a heart is, is, or a lungs, a set of lungs, they have a particular unique feature to them. But then as you then begin to slice into it, you discover more about the function, more about the operation, more about the intricate, intricate way in which so many different parts of this organ is integrated. And then you begin to understand more about actually how that functions and really fundamentally what it is. And so it is with the Word of God. We're not going to discover some hidden meaning, some, you know, the thing that is going to make it different than what it is presented to be on the surface. We're just going to be able to break into it and understand more details about it. And in that, we learn how to function in the wisdom, hopefully, of God and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to move with God, to understand what God is doing, to understand his movings. What wisdom? Wisdom that understands the movings of God is wisdom above all other wisdom. That's insight that is greater than all other insights or perception. Then we find ourselves now being that much more cooperative with what God is doing, receiving the divine ability that he's given to be able to live out our lives in a heavenly realm 
here in this earthly sphere to know how to walk under the authority of the divine when we're constantly being bombarded and 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 attacked by the things that belong to the realms of the demonic to know how to be able to stand in this wonderful grace this wonderful salvation this wonderful glory that has been given to us so that's what we're doing here we're not trying to propagate our own ideas of the word of god we're not trying to indoctrinate people i don't, I don't want to indoctrinate anyone we, we have the Word of God. I want my job and my hope is that I can help challenge you to go to the source, to go to the Word of God and begin to understand what Father has said to us and let every uh, one of us recognize the, the value that, that each of us have and, and the, the beauty of having so many eyes on the topic, so to speak, and then hearing from everybody as they, with an honest and sincere heart, search out the Word of God because they're not trying to defend their own bias. They're really in pursuit of all the truth that is conveyed to us by the Holy Ghost. Who is the Holy Spirit? He's going to lead us and guide us into all truth. He's the one that, that, that caused this wonderful work of Jesus Christ to be made known to us. He's the revealer of Jesus. Once again, breaking out all of those categories about who the Holy Spirit is, who the Holy Ghost is, who the Spirit of the Lord is, who the Spirit of God is, <laughs> the Spirit of Christ Jesus, I mean, this, the, the Spirit of the Son. Once again, wh what are we doing? We're just broadening the, the, uh, the understanding of a, a single topic. And uh, that's salvation in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's purchased for us. So, let me go back, just go back with me um, to Acts 10.44, and let's look at the same word. Let's see here. I typed in the wrong place. Acts 10.44. Let's go look at the same word. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them. So that is exactly, really, it's the same word, okay? It's the same Greek word used there in Acts 10.44, um, as you see it right there in Acts uh, 8.16. So we understand the Holy Ghost had not fallen, or he had not, he did not fall on any of them. Um, it wasn't as, as it was said here in uh, Cornelius' house, the Holy Ghost fell. Well, the Holy Ghost didn't fall on them at Samaria. Um when Philip was preaching, there was great signs and wonders and miracles taking place with Philip. But the Holy Ghost, the gift of the Holy Ghost, this particular dimension of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, to baptize in the Holy Ghost in fire, doesn't take away from it the ministry of Jesus as high priest, the ministry of Jesus as Savior. If anyone calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus, they will be saved. It just begins to bring to us distinctions. It begins to bring to us uh, a, a bigger picture of all that God is doing on our behalf. The Word of God should be working within us, a hunger and a thirst, rather than a response of, oh, do I have to have this? I mean, I think that a lot of people are just offended by the concept um, of this particular ministry of the Lord Jesus because they're offended by the utterances of the Spirit and the language of the Spirit. And... That's another topic, and I don't want to get into that right now, but I do want to point out to you something that you should have categorized, you know, when you're just looking through all the actions and activities of the Holy Ghost, because you see here now another way in which we equate this work of the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost is seen to have, to be the one who falls, okay, fell on them. And then we understand then from verse 45 that this is the gift of the Holy Ghost. So here, look at all that we have now. Look at the connectivity as you begin to work through Acts 10, 44 on down through, and through to into Acts 11. You begin to see so many working parts here that are synonymous, okay? So we already saw where the baptism of the Holy Ghost and being filled with the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 1, 5, Acts chapter 1, 8, and Acts chapter 2, 2, and two through four are equivalent. They're equivalent to be baptized. They were filled. Okay. Now we're seeing how that the Holy Ghost is described as 
falling to, in, in this particular instance, he fell on them. Or in a particular instance at Samaria, he had not fallen on them yet. Same Greek word, same context. We've not violated context. We're looking at two witnesses. In fact, we're looking at three, four, five witnesses now. And one of the things that I want to do before we start drawing out too many results and too many conclusions is we've got to walk through all of our hermeneutical rules and we've got to ask the questions. When we write out a conclusion here, as we're working our way towards this conclusion, as we're gathering the information, we're going to say, okay, here's our conclusion about the Holy Ghost and the work of the Holy Ghost as it relates to Acts chapter 8, uh, verses, especially verse uh, 15 and 16, concerning something that happened to the Samaritans before they received this gift of the Holy Ghost, which now we have, and it, we have it equated. The gift of the Holy Ghost is equated with the Holy Ghost falling upon a person or a people or a group. And this whole context and pericope is equated by Peter himself to the exact same thing that happened to them on the day of Pentecost. And we're going to find out that not only does it describe these, this activity of the Holy Ghost as having uh, fallen upon us or when he falls upon us or having fell upon us, but it's also equated to being filled so in reality, being baptized, being filled, the Holy Ghost falling on you, these are, these are equal terms. Somebody said, well, why don't we have different descriptions and expressions? Certainly there's things that we should actually be able then to parse out here. Well, the first thing is to, that may be true, but the first thing to do is to appreciate the commonality, the similarity, and even the synonymous, synonymous expressions, as it were, when we begin to use these words. Because it may be, it may be, I'm not saying that it is, that it may be just different ways of saying exactly the same thing. And that there really isn't any unique thing that we need to parse out. Other than to say, when he falls upon us, we're also filled with him. <laughs> And, you know, then we can begin to say, well, when we're filled with him, when we can begin to understand the ministry of Jesus in Acts chapter 7, when he says, come and drink of this water, okay, he's now using this allegory that is used by the prophets of old, especially Isaiah, and out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water, this spake he of the Holy Ghost. Uh-oh, that was in your categories, right? Which was not yet given. Once again, the action, the activity, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so he's now equated, the, you know, Luke chapter 24, you know, this is the promise of the Father. It's, the, it's this, you know, gift, of, this, um, this gift of God, the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, I haven't really actually gotten to all the places that he uses the word gift of God, but specifically the gift of the Holy Ghost. And his expression of the very life of God, okay, because we would need to go over really and begin to spend more time exegeting um, John chapter um, 7 and verse 38 and 39 to really begin to uh, flesh this out some more. But truly, he's speaking of the life of God so coming upon us, so filling us that it is an unlimited expression of his divine grace and glory, okay? That the only way you can begin to describe, a, describe it is not as a singular river, but rivers. And of course, rivers or a river is specifically different from a stream or a creek. Um, a river is not going to run dry. A river is continuous, it's ongoing. So look at the things that God is saying about this wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit. His role, his responsibilities, his action, those things that are that that are specifically accredited to him in the work of redemption, in the work of salvation, in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the in the in the life of the believer, in the work of of, of grace within our life. The grace of God has appeared to all men, teaching us to, to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Look at all of these different verses of scripture. Once again, folding itself into this one beautiful and glorious message 
of salvation. Nothing to argue about, rather something to receive revelation about, understanding about, divine insight about, to be filled with the knowledge of God and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that we may walk worthy of him and being you know, fruitful <laughs> in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, a knowledge that cannot be learned within the framework of human knowledge. It is divine knowledge that uh, God has made available to us through his word. And it is the Holy Spirit that then unveils his word and makes his word known to us. And, and so if we can't hook up with the word of God, then we can't hook up with the spirit of God because what the word of God is saying, what the spirit of God is saying are going to be exactly the same thing. Okay, so... Um, yeah, there's, there's obviously a lot more to say on this, on the subject. Um, I hope that what you're getting here from this lecture is an appreciation of how you begin to expand a single word or topic or expression where you can begin to make certain first and foremost that it does meet the criteria, um, of context, you know, that it does indeed um, uh, have two or three witnesses. And once again, once we set out these conclusions and we will begin to do this in, in the upcoming lectures and we begin to write them out and we're specifically, you know, drawing them out and we're saying, yes, this is what the word of God says. Here are the verses of scripture. Then we're going to ask of those conclusions. Do you actually live up to every rule of hermeneutics? And if it doesn't, then we've got to recognize, well, we have more work to do. Okay, so, you know, if you're acquainted with my writings and the, thing, the books that I write, and, of course, there's a lot of other great scholars out there, you know, great men of God who've written amazing things. And, you know, there's some that are great men of God that have written amazing things that haven't actually done this, but, you know, and, and we still appreciate them. But it's best when someone, you know, makes a statement, and then they put at least two or, verse, or two or three verses of scripture there to support that statement. And so it's a challenge for you. If you begin to write out today, and it would take you probably a long time, what all do you believe? Okay, for example, um, I believe in the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. And then you write out all the verses of scripture that support that the name of Jesus has authority. I believe that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from sin. And you write out all the verses of scripture that support that. If does everything that you believe clearly meet all of those rules of hermeneutics, you know, and that's just two or three in, you know, as I said, context, you know, is, is so very, very important. And so it's an exercise you want to get into. And I hope that as you're going through this, you are already starting to write out your results and your conclusions. You should already have results that you have, that things that you could say about the Holy Ghost, the ministry of the Holy Ghost. What is, you know, Jesus said, if I cast out devils, Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, another word, another name for the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. The power, he went forth in the power of the Holy Ghost. Understanding that that same power and that same authority that was attributed to the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, the Holy Ghost. He has anointed me. And, and of course, it was really all about, and we could quote the verse of Scripture, but it's all about the acts of, of authority and power and signs and wonders, the expression of divine love that was activated and revealed through Christ Jesus' life, which he referred to as the works of the Father. It's the Father doing the work even though we know it was the action activity of the Holy Ghost. Okay, I'm taking you off on another tangent. However, I'm wanting to, you know, challenge you. And what happens is people then will say, oh, they'll lock in on one piece of this and say, oh, this is the way it is. No, 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 that isn't the way it is. That's a part of the way it is. The way it is is much bigger, okay? <laughs> because there's three individual persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And that is established clearly throughout the Bible. And they are one. And they function as one in the uniqueness of their personalities and their persons. Okay? And what you say about one, you say about the other. And they work continually in such union that you can't see a separation. Okay. I, once again, another topic to explore. 
touching a little bit on it just because we're looking at the Holy Ghost, the action and the work, activity of the Holy Ghost, which we could, as I said, attribute. As you study this out, to the actions and works and activity of the Father himself. Hallelujah. And Jesus, he was just dependent upon that activity because he was being a model for us. He was born of the Spirit. He was baptized in the Spirit. Born of the Spirit in the sense that he's the incarnated word. We're born of the Spirit in the sense that we're born again. Hallelujah. That is our beginning in God. He has no beginning. He is everlasting and everlasting. He was incarnated. We were born again. We were born. <laughs> he was incarnated, okay? And, and very important subjects, topics, things that people so easily misunderstand. And, and, and they go to seed on. I mean, it's like the other day someone was uh, uh, emailing me, a dear friend, and just talking about some of the things that people want to say about 1 Corinthians 4, uh, 14. And verse 34, 35, where you women are supposed to keep silence in the church, not understanding the context. Because if you just look back in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 6, Paul's already told them how they're supposed to pray and prophesy in the church. So, you know, once again, it's like, it's like somebody pulled a, a you know, a, a scripture from the daily bread. And they read that and they said, that's it. Well, no, that ain't, that, that isn't it. In the country, we say, that ain't it. Okay. That is not the whole picture. Okay. There's something unique being said there. And of course, if you took that and you contrast and compare 1 Corinthians 14, 35 to 1 Corinthians 11, 6, I believe that I'm right on 11, 6, but it's, it's in the near vicinity. Then you've got a contradiction. you got a contradiction. And when you have a contradiction, uh-oh, it failed the rules of hermeneutics. Right now, the things that we have been saying, we're not finding contradictions here, okay? We haven't gone there yet. What we're finding is we're finding a a a broader picture of the whole thing. I mean, you couldn't set it up. Oh, well, you know, Cornelius' house must have not been saved because they didn't believe on the name of the Lord Jesus and get baptized first like they did over at Samaria and then receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. They just got the gift of the Holy Ghost and afterwards they had to do, you know, makeup duty and now go get baptized and believe on the name of Jesus. It didn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. We're not going to lock God into a box. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is the power unto salvation and brings to us all the riches and the supply of heaven. And so we've got to look at this broader sense of how God is going to get the things done that he's purposed to do. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm probably just about out of time. Um, and so what I want to do is at least with what little bit of time that I do have left. And uh, let's see here. Okay, I hope I've tied all those things together for you from Acts chapter 2 um, and Acts chapter 10 and as it, is, as it is uniquely associated with Acts chapter 8 that I have broadened the view of what it means for the Holy Ghost to fall upon someone for the Holy Ghost had not yet fallen upon them. Well, then you ask the question, what does it look like for the Holy Ghost to fall on somebody? What does it mean for the Holy Ghost to fall on someone? Then we get over to Acts chapter 10, verse 44, and we say, well, lo and behold, this is what it looks like when the Holy Ghost has fallen upon someone. And then we say, oh my goodness, <laughs> now we're really getting it because Peter says this is exactly what happened to us on the day of Pentecost. And I reckon he knows what he's talking about because he was there. He was in both places. So if somebody else is going to come along and try to tell us something di different or unique about what happened at Cornelius' house, other than what Peter said, then they are wrong because they weren't there. Peter was. He was there in Acts chapter 2, and he was there in Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, he said, this is just what happened to us. So in Acts chapter 2, when they were baptized in the Holy Ghost, or in other words, filled with the Holy Ghost, at that time, the Holy Ghost fell on them. <laughs> now, that isn't a stretch. And I hope you can appreciate that. That is just looking at the flow of the context of Scripture as we begin to just simply categorize these singular words. Then the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher, praise God, who's not going to be doing, saying, or leading us in any direction other than the Word of God, is available to everyone, is no respecter of persons, who's going to do exactly what he promised to do. If we approach the God uh, God and his word with fear and trembling, and we are willing to learn, broken and contrite, walking in humility before the Lord, recognizing we want what he has to teach us. 
When we're going to hold on to ideas, we want to know what it is he wants to communicate to us. So in the name of Jesus, I hope you appreciate this. I'm not going to get to laying out and categorizing uh, salvation, but we're going to do that. And we're going to just run down salvation, saved, those synonyms associated with that, so that we can be convinced of what happened to these guys in, in Samaria. And then after that, we're going to contrast and compare the various different salvation events in Acts. And after we've done that, then we're going to start distilling out conclusions. And I want you to already start working ahead on this. Of course, if you are in the class, listen to me, all of you students that are sitting in the class uh, in Washington State, you are going to be responsible. There's going to be one big test question and, that I'm going to give you. And you are going to be responsible for turning in your exegesis, uh, and the app, which is fundamentally showing the application of all the hermeneutical rules to the conclusions that you're that you've made about these verses of scripture as they relate to salvation, uh, baptism, and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay, love all of you. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Uh, see you tomorrow.